so that I can concentrate on social business as a calling. I think we have lost uh, uh, Dr. Goodler there, maybe an internet issue. As she, as she reconnects, be able to tell you briefly about, um, about her. Uh, Dr. Goodler is an academician, an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur, and a leader. Uh, she, she has held she has a bachelor's degree, a PhD from Makere, a master's from York University, a PhD from University of Ghent in Belgium. She's a Fulbright scholar, uh, served at uh, Ghana Matters University as a senior lecturer and director center for distance learning. She's also an associate professor of Bishop Stewart University. She has written 43 manuals, uh, this is the infopreneur part. Um, you can concentrate on giving people the information that they need. And this is what makes an infopreneur. So you just keep uh, sending out information that people need to help them grow, especially uh, personally and in their businesses. Uh, through that, she has written 43 manuals, published two books, produced 12 songs, and has six inventions. She's a founder of Goody, Goody Media which is Goody TV and Goody Farm Radio. As a social entrepreneur, she is the managing director and founder of uh, Goody Leisure Farm and Goody Incubation Center, providing employment opportunities for 294 people. She has incubated or helped people start their businesses from all over the country. That is 100, over 100,000 people. Uh, and these have come from 27 districts and 740 parishes from in Uganda. And they're active all over the country, leading transformation and change in their communities. She's also organized the Youth for Youth, the white meat value chain at the parish, district, and national level. She's the initiator of the Pella Dika Hubs model development, where different people go there to develop land production, creativity processing, health, agrotourism, trading, and financial and documentation. Ah, doctor, welcome back. Thank you. Okay, I'll just tell people briefly about your profile. Uh, I was also saying, <coughs> uh, initiator of the regional spotlight that puts youth at the driving seat of transforming their regions from an informed point of view of history, culture, and pride. She has won a number of awards and is on a number of boards, such as you will, GFCU Bank, Parisasa Foundation. These are both former and current. Casita, Makere Business Schooling Center, and also member for NARO, among others. Uh, doctor, you, maybe you can say, of all the things that you're doing, can you tell us briefly about where your journey began and what were the key points which led you from sector to sector? Thank you very much. My journey began from a very bad incident. We were attacked by thieves in the year 2006. These were two young men. As my husband was coming back from work, he, he had his own key of the house. Then he started banging and I looked through the window 
and I saw three people. And normally, I would have expected two people. So when I came down and said, hello, they said, we are thieves open for us. As long as you cooperate, we have no problem. So I went back dressed, started calling the police, calling everyone except my neighbor who picked the rest didn't pick. So I opened and they said, for us, we are thieves. Just cooperate, we shall do our job and go. So they moved around the house everywhere in a very, very short time, picked what they wanted and left. The next day, it appeared in the newspapers that the doctors had been attacked. And at that point, it was a turning point for me that nobody was concerned about the thieves because the thieves had made a big risk to come to attack us first. They didn't know whether we were armed or not, whether we had guards or not. And I thought, what would make somebody risk their life to go and steal? Instead of blaming them, I said, let me start something that becomes a launch pad for people who are desperate to begin their own lives instead of resorting to stealing. So we had bought land earlier in Nigeria before we went to do our PhDs. We had saved money so that if one gets a scholarship, another one can be safe sponsored. But luckily, both of us got a scholarship and we decided to keep this money in land. We bought 14 acres in Nigeria. So after that incident of the thieves, I said, okay, I have this land. I can use it as an opportunity to bring youth to construct themselves. And after that, they can go and begin their own journeys. So we, did, we went on a call to invite youth who are not employed to come to the farm. It was not a business in any way. We spent more than we had to spend. We employed more than we actually needed. But what we did during that whole time, they would develop what we call a personal growth journal. And we followed them for growth. And the graduation was always after three years. There was no renewal of contract. You had by that time to have created your own job and you are employing other people. This became very exciting as people started graduating even earlier because you had our job, but you spent all the time working on your own job. And later I learned that this should have been intubation, but somehow at that point, we didn't know that it was intubation. So you would choose the business you want. You, we start mentoring while you are doing our work. It gives you money, but you're concentrating on your own business. So when you are reporting, we had weekly reporting meetings. You are always reporting about your business. Now, this went on. No business knowledge, no anything. It was like a hobby. Then later, I went to do my postdoc in the year 2009. And this is when it became clear that I should actually concentrate on this part of work. It was always something exciting. I was always happy to go into those meetings where they are reporting what they have done in the world. And then on one side, I had my other director saying, but you're not making any money. Why are you excited about this whole thing? So when I went in 2009, I was alone during my postdoc at George Washington University. And I spent a lot of time reflecting on how can I make this model more sustainable? So first of all, I had no business knowledge. And I said, when I come back, I'm going to register with the Uganda Women Entrepreneurs Association. I had heard about them, but I'd never had keen interest there because all the time I was busy at university, I was at Uganda Matters University, it's very far. You, you, you are moving the whole week, you come back tired, you have no time to interact with other people. So I started figuring out how best I can do this in a sustainable way. I had followed my mother, my mother was a community worker who spent all the time working in the communities, training women how to bake, how to make crafts so they can sustain themselves. And I used to go as a bag holder with little interest in what she was doing. But afterwards I thought, okay, probably this was mentoring, but I need to take it to a higher level where I can make it sustainable. So when I returned, I joined Uganda Women Entrepreneurs immediately. 
And I saw young women talking about their businesses, having their products, being organized. Meanwhile, for me, as I was doing my work, I wasn't registered. I was just there. So I decided to register the business and become a student. In the middle of being a student, maybe because of the teaching background, one particular AGM, the Women Entrepreneurs, chose me to be their chairperson. This was like a shock. How do you choose someone who is actually learning, who doesn't even have all the basics of business? But the way God works in mysterious ways, for me, this was a learning point for me, an acceleration. So whatever I would tell the women, I would have to come back and say, I have to do that. I have to be compliant. I have to do this and this. So I started working on my business so that I can fit in my position as a leader for women entrepreneurs. So the next title that came up is how do we, what business should we do? I had grown up from an area of farming, although I wasn't very much involved in farming, but we had cows at home. And then my dad also had a transport business, but whenever we were going to school, he always sold bulls so that we can go to school. We are a dozen at home and we all went to good schools. And for us, bulls were like the ATM of today. So somehow I thought that for everyone to grow, you had to have cows. So I started this model using cows. So I was able to write a proposal and get a grant of 116,000 US dollars. And we started a project for women so that we can have the women support their families. It was a project for Haifa with, with partnership of Rotary International and our local club of Rotary in Kololo. So we started this project. It was exciting to give 22 women cows water tanks, cow sheds. The women started businesses. We trained them on business. They kept cash books. They were able to do a cost benefit analysis and it was very exciting. And our plan was that this was in 2010, that when you have a calf, you'll give it to another woman. So I had 15 groups of women that were lined up. So this one moment when we are giving the calves to the next group of women, it came to my mind that I've actually told a lie to the poor. Because first of all, it takes a long time for cows to multiply. And these were 15 groups in line and some of the groups had over 100 members. So it was like some of these people will get cows when they are 30, 40 years from now. And that would definitely be a lie. So for every business, of course, you have to keep reviewing your own plan. Your plans cannot be written in stone. You have to keep checking yourself if you're actually telling the truth, especially to yourself. Because nobody told me this, but I had to realize it myself. Then I said, no, I've got to think about animals of a shorter lifespan. So I decided to shift to go into poultry. So we went into local chicken. During that time, one of the women entrepreneurs invited me to go and speak to them at Insimbe, and they gave me 100,000 as the thank you. I didn't have a clear use for this 100,000, so I decided to buy six local chicken. When I bought the six local chicken, I didn't even have where to put it. I had land, yes, I had the farm, people on the farm were into rice, were into fish, but I didn't have a plan for it. So I said, okay, let me go with the chicken. I don't know where to put the chicken. But my friend, luckily, was constructing in Tinda shopping mall. Then I asked her to give me pieces of timber. And she dropped the timber herself. And luckily, the timber had nails in it. This timber they use for holding the ring beam. So we constructed a makeshift chicken pen. And we started raising the chicken. They started laying. Then I took the, chicken, the, the eggs to a local place where they do the hatching. The numbers started multiplying up to the point when we had 30,000 local chicken. As far as I know, we were the first people to put local chicken into the supermarket. Our brand was Woody Chick. We were in Uchumi, we were in Capital, 
we were also in a quality. So this business went on, but until one day, when I go to the shelves and I'm checking, I'm looking at my chicken, its price. I looked at the broiler, the chicken of six weeks and the chicken of six months are having the same price. And I thought this is being stupid, definitely. How can I spend all that time to earn the same as somebody who spent six weeks? So I noticed that this was definitely not business, whereas most of the work I was doing was more of a hobby, but yet I had the obligation of being sustainable. <clears throat> so that time we decided to change, to go into broilers. We did broilers who were supplying 500 birds per day, which was a very good business, still in the same network. So we hardly slept every night we were slaughtering, but it was a good business. Money was coming in. Until this one particular time when they call me, the youth call me and tell me, you know what? Our chicken is dying. We are losing something like 100, 200. So we, within a period of three weeks, we had lost all the chicken that we had and all our chicken was synchronized. So we lost all the chicken. Meanwhile, as the chicken was dying, we were, as we had a vet that was attached to us and the vet kept saying, feed them, keep them warm because they would shiver. Then later we just said, why don't we just check? We go to vet and check what was happening to the, to the chicken. Uh, vet confirmed we had gotten food poisoning. We had bought food from Tseni and this food must have had some toxins in it and we didn't realize it, which is also a very important thing for anyone in business. You don't have to be a scientist, but you have to understand the basics of your business and you have to control for inputs. So we lost an entire business of chicken and that was not the most painful thing. But what was painful is the commitment we had made with the people who were selling for us. Because the people kept calling, are you bringing to them? Because we were, I think we were the most reliable suppliers. And we said, no, are you bringing next week? No. So we couldn't bring back this chicken. Luckily, we had not taken a loan. But again, remember, I have all these workers that have been there raising all this chicken. I had 35 workers, each one having their own batch. So I have workers, but I have no job for them. And I have to pay them. The farm is not bringing in any money. So that was very challenging for us. Then we thought, okay, how can we go for chicken, which is in between? It grows fast, but it doesn't require, it's not as delicate. So we went in for croiler. Croilers have, had just come during that time. So we started doing croiler. Croiler did very, very well. And it helped us also to go to the communities we wanted to work with. At that time, we were working in six districts and we introduced croilers. And what we would do, we would give a particular group 1,000 birds on credit. Then they raise these birds. And once it comes to time for laying eggs, they divide maybe 10 people, each one gets 100 birds. Then they pay back in form of eggs, which would be sold in a central place. That one worked so well, as long as the groups had integrity. We had a particular group that did not have integrity and never returned the money. Then I got another lesson out there that trust is good, but trust must be tested. Yes, because this particular group not returning the money, it made it difficult for us to trust other groups. So we said, now for you to have the chicks, you must pay upfront. And of course, this was against our own model because we're looking at supporting people at the base of the pyramid who have no capacity to afford. But here we were saying, before you can get the chicks, you must pay. Although they were always guaranteed of the market. So we went on with the chicken. Now, we went back now to slaughtering and selling. Then we had a lot of waste, we had a lot of offers and stuff like that. I was just thinking, okay, where do we put this? Meanwhile, where we are working from, our farm, we have a compliance agreement with NEMA. 
what enters the, for example, the water which enters the farm must be the same quality as the water leaving the farm. There is, there is control around smell, there's control around noise, all those things. And we had signed this agreement with NEMA. So we had all this waste that we didn't have a use for. Then someone told me, oh, no, no, you can do pigs. So we brought in pigs. So we we'll use part of the, all the remains of the animals we didn't want to feed them to the pigs. Then we also had fish. So it became a zero waste farm, but also reduced our cost of doing business. So finally, right now, we are running with four value chain. We have rabbit, we have chicken, we have fish, and we have pigs. And they are all running in a cyclic way. Now, as the youth continued growing, the youth groups started growing, started producing, but we had not given them enough training. And remember, we had been burnt by not knowing the science of raising these animals. So I said, okay, let me start writing because writing was something that is like a hobby for me. So I started putting knowledge together and writing and sending it to the youth as manuals. Now, I, then another challenge came up. Not everybody loves reading. We said, but why can't we come and learn there instead of reading these manuals? And these manuals were all in English. So they always had to have somebody interpreting for them. And interpreting some of the English words and science things can be a challenge for if some people. So we said, okay, let's start bringing the people, the youth, to learn from the farm. First, we don't have all the infrastructure for housing them, but we have the need, the heart, and we're excited about that entire thing. So people started coming to learn from the farm, and we said, we come to accommodate you. So you come in the night, you use the night bus. You study the entire Saturday and you leave Saturday evening. Every weekend we had youth coming to learn from different parts of the districts where we were operating. That time we were in Amoratal, we were in Hoima, we were in Soro, we were in Isindiro, we were in Movende, and youth would come like, so it continued like that, but it was extremely stressful. Some of them would even sleep in class, but it went on, that's what we could afford by that time. Then we got in touch with the private sector foundation. They learned about what we were doing. And they started giving us youth for internship. So we started doing internship for the youth, but they didn't like the, our place. Our accommodation was not good to be able to have these youth. So we had to move so quickly to make sure that we can fit into what they required. So at times, external forces help you to improve yourself better than your own, your own self. Once you know that you have something to lose, if you don't comply, you work so hard. So we started doing this and our, our youth would be retained because our model was always retain the youth until they have what to do. So this went on for a long time and we're enjoying it. Then we started having organizations that were interested in what we're doing for their own benefit, but also our benefit. Organizations like SOS, like Avis Foundation, like MasterCard Foundation, they were interested in training youth to be employed. And here we were, we had the model, we had the different people who trained for us that were willing. Among the people that were training for us, we had narrow. By God's grace, I was asked to represent the private sector on the narrow council. And this was also an opportunity for me to learn so many things that are happening, a lot of research, a lot of technologies out there. So whenever I needed any support technically, I would always call on narrow. They would come free. I wouldn't even have to pay anything. I wouldn't even afford it anyway. But they were always happy to be part of our technical team that does the technical backstopping. So this training goes on, but we start growing as an incubation center, we get infrastructure. So starting from people who could not house anyone, then we now have infrastructure that can house 500 incubators at the same time, which is exciting. And we still get incubators. We still run our other model where you come in, train, work, 
support your own business while we support our own business so that we can be sustainable. Of course, at times we'll be tempted to have more youth than we actually can support, but we had to keep thinking about sustainability. How do we make money out of this whole thing to keep us moving, to keep us supporting more youth? So we went out of the production and maybe this is very important for businesses. There are things you are going to do at a certain stage of your business, but there are those you are going to give out to other people so that you can move on to the next level. So we decided to get out of production and left the production for the youth as their main business. And instead, we started organizing the markets. Right now within Kampala, Mokono, and Wakiso, we have 30,000 youth that have trained only for marketing. And marketing is very important for any business, knowing where your products will go. People who tell you, I got burnt, I started chicken, I never got money, I started, most likely there was an issue <laughs> with marketing. So we decided to concentrate on organizing the market and let the production go to the youth. So right now, our business model and how we earn from it is commission on the meat we get from the youth and give to the other youth to be able to market it. Of course, it's not short of challenges as well. There is a lot of logistical arrangement. There is a lot of synchronization that we require because we know that the youth require about 10 tons of meat per day. You need to know where this meat is coming from. Is the meat coming from Kampala? Is the meat coming from uh, Ruero? How is it coming? When will it arrive? When will it be taken by these other youth? That's a lot of planning that you have to be engaged with. But of course, right now we are happy that as a farm, we have 294 staff. That helps us to keep at our toes doing that particular work. Then the other thing that came up, we started supplying uh, meat. We are big suppliers of meat in Kampala, home deliveries and stuff like that. And the home delivery became even bigger during COVID-19 because we noticed that we cannot have our customers go to buy the meat. So we started making fryers. They were moving everywhere on WhatsApp. And people said, okay, bring for me, bring here, bring here. Then we had our own network of motorcycle riders and we started the home delivery. So COVID-19 helped us to actualize what we wanted to do, but we were so slow at doing it. So uh, the meat is going on. We still have an issue with the cold chain. The youth must take the meat which they can consume there and then. And if the meat gets finished before time, they have to order. So they spend transport twice. So at times this increases the cost of doing business. So last year in October, we get a challenge. We got an inferno. Maybe you heard about it. In this night, it was on 21st, our entire pottery building got burnt with 50,000 birds of youth. And I kept asking myself, who could even think of such a thing, knowing that these birds belong to youth who are trying to build themselves? So it got burnt. It was very sad. The youth were not happy. But as a farm, we decided that... Uh, we, as a farm and an entire network, we say that we make a living living and we don't mourn forever. So we, we decided to make a party to say bye to that entire thing and start a new line of thinking. So we didn't put back the pottery houses. Instead, we shifted them to another campus. We have three campuses. There's another campus which is bigger. And we decided to leave that place as a place for happiness because we are also into agritourism. As if that was not enough, at the beginning of the year, then we get swine fever, where we lost about 16,000 pigs due to swine fever. Still, this was the youth's project. We lost that, so we lost income, but we are still alive and we are still moving. So what, what are the lessons about recovery whenever you have a challenge. We cannot control all the challenges 100%, but when the challenges come, how soon do you get up? 
You can choose to stay mourning. It's okay, you can mourn, but it's up to you, especially the owner of the business, to take lead for you to start recovering, to, to look at other opportunities that you can actually do. So when we lost our pigs, we started uh, another project for production of the black soldier fly. And we are producing black soldier fly and we are able to feed our different farms that are raising the animals that we have. Then we decided to rely on the animals that were on another campus. We have another campus in Isinjiro where we have the pigs. So we no longer have pigs on this other campus. Instead, we have only chicken and fish. We took the pigs to another campus, but we also took chicken to another campus. Now, within this whole business, we are serving a customer who is becoming more regular, and the customer is accustomed to our meat in a certain way. They want a certain taste of meat. And this is also very important for all of us in business to be able to study the customer, customer habits, customer tests, because in the end, you are actually working for that customer, whether you like it or not. So we, we have customers who don't want pork that has eaten fish. We have customers who want chicken at a certain age, certain weight. So all those things we have to control for them. And that's why we, we are so much engaged in training. First, first training, virtual training, and training at parishes so that we maintain the standard. This customer who is buying our chicken, every day or every week should test the same chicken regardless of which farmer raised the chicken. So as business people, we also have a responsibility of standardizing our product so that the customer does not think this is a new product altogether. No, the product should be standardized and that requires a lot of training and it takes a lot of money. So that's an investment we have to be prepared for. So we are doing training uh, as the moderator said, I think Mr. Were, we are in uh, 27 districts. We are in each region of this country. We are in uh, 740 parishes. And all these have youth that we have trained. We have trained 112,900 youth. These youth know what we are doing. But we decided to go for what we call the value chain linkage. In each parish, we started by training six youth. The six youth, one is in charge of feeds. All they learned about is how to prepare feeds for our four different animals. And they prepare the same feed the same way that they were trained. Then we have the youth that raise the animals. They have about 57 SOPs they have to follow. And we have to check on these records because it will produce for us the meat that is required. For example, we sell our pokers when they are 50 kilos. And they have to be 50 kilos at a particular age. So there are too many things to control. Farming is no longer anybody's business, retired man's business, broke man's business, uneducated man's business. No, <laughs> we have to invest in the time, the work, the learning. And the good news is that there's a lot of information that we can also benefit from, from different farmer networks, trainings like the one we are having today that enable us to improve our business. Then we have the third youth who's in charge of marketing. We do marketing at local level, at the parish level, at the district level. We have the youth who's in charge of transport whom we have trained how do you transport meat so that by the time it reaches, the meat has not changed its taste. Then we have the youth who adds value, the ones who do the roasting. And these are the ones we mainly have around Kampala, Mukon, and Wakiso, but also in the different parishes, there are always youth that do the roasting, running small, small joints where you maybe you roast one 50 kilos of pork a day. But in so doing, we have distributed the market, but we have also increased on access points for people to Uh, uh, Dr. Goodler. Able to test our meat, appreciate. Then we have a youth who is in charge of health promotion. And this youth is responsible for making sure they take care of the health of the environment, the health of the animal, the health of the farmer, the health of the plant. 
So we make our own pesticides, organic pesticides. We make our own fertilizers. We have our own order neutralizer. We have our own herbs and spices for, put, for marinating the meat. So you find that you start with one small business. You say, okay, I'm going to be raising chicken, but then you have to go all the way to ensure that you, you, you control the entire value chain. Because whatever goes wrong will affect the, all the people that you have in your value chain. So I don't know if there is a point where you are go I'm going to be asked questions. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> we were listening in. Uh, thank you very much. This is, wow, it's an amazing, amazing work and amazing stuff that you have done. Uh, please, people, you can post uh, your questions or comments in chat. Uh, Dr. Butler, is it possible to, uh, to show the video? Yes. Yeah, internet is... But Okay, I think I have to be allowed. Ah, uh, okay. Now it's okay. Uh, yeah. So all this stuff, uh, we as enterprise, we supported a number of farmers who went through the swine fever, uh, swine yeah. flu last year. You go to farms and people have been wiped out. You have talked about yeah. birds uh, dying from disease, which happens a lot with uh, broilers, especially. Um, those ones just get wiped out all the way. You talked about uh, the birds burning and a lot of things. What is this mindset that you have that for a lot of people, we have seen them, they go through some of these things and they say, oh, man, yeah, I'm, I'm no longer doing this thing. I am now going to do and get a job and just leave this business alone. How comes that you're able to, what is this mindset that you have and what drives it to make sure that you're always thinking about this has failed, I'm not going to do this next. Oh, this one is doing well. Let me go to another thing. You also talked about letting go of one of your core business operations to concentrate on something else. Yet this is something a lot of our entrepreneurs will not do. You're like, ah, this is working. I'm going to keep with this one because it is working. But you keep evolving. You keep going through all these things. What is it that drives this? I think one of the key things that drives this is being a student of your own business, committing to be a student so that your business can teach you many things, and also being your own auditor. Because at times we delegate all the important responsibilities of the founder to other people. But you as a founder, you have a purpose. In our case, we want to reach as many youth as possible that are, are, are sustainable for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. So we are looking forward to expanding opportunities for these youth. So when you fall and you, you don't get up, there are many people who are going to be affected because there are many people who are following us. You have all these 100,000 youth following you. So if you choose to keep mourning over this loss, it's a missed opportunity especially for people who are following you. So I think there is motivation in the ecosystem, knowing that you have to keep moving on, but also the ecosystem gives you encouragement. Like when we had a fire, the youth, we have a group where we all meet, it's a telegram, and they say, no, we shall construct it. As no, long as we look, get the material, we shall, we shall come and construct it. So you get energized, you have to find your own points, of energizing yourself, something that will excite you. And then the youth also said, we have the pigs, we can provide stock for the parent stock. So you have a support system, it can be a social network. The youth are having very small businesses, but they were willing to support us to restart these businesses because they had the animals that we actually needed to start the business. We didn't take it up, but it was good to know that somebody out there was there. So as business people who is in our network, who can pull us out of a mess, or who can push us to get out of the mess, you don't have to give support, but at times you can push someone out of that worry, mess, uh, life has stopped, that kind of thinking. The issue of preparing yourself to move to the next level, is very, very important because we, we get comfortable with certain things. When we were into production, we knew our cost benefit analysis very well. We know what we are putting in 
I know that if I'm raising 500 birds, this is what I expect in a day. It was very, very comfortable. But then I said, I'm training youth to do the same. How am I going to compete with the youth to do that? That's when I had to move to the next level. And now we are moving to the another level, which should be like in the middle. This is the level of processing. We are putting up processing plants so that we are able to have different products of meat. We can have your sausages, your salami, your burgers, etc. And I see that that's where I need to be to allow the youth do more. And we have better facilities for packaging and marketing them. That's where my role is. So in every business, we have to keep looking at what is my next level. Then you start learning early enough so that it doesn't come when you are not preaching. Agriculture is a science. Agriculture, oh, no, no, that has ended. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. There are a few questions that have come in. I've taken note of a few things of build an ecosystem around you, a support system. This is very important for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs tend to work in silos, yet you can reach out to your competitor and they'll be able to help you. Uh, this is something we really encourage at Enterprise Uganda and also having the Global Entrepreneurship Week coming up with a number of events. We shall be sending you emails with some of these events. You can choose which one to attend physically or virtually in order to actually build networks, build an ecosystem around you that works. Because sometimes things are down and your ecosystem will be able to keep you afloat. Otherwise, mm -hmm. if you're on your own, you will not be able to go through these challenging times that we have had in the last two, three years. Uh, there are a few comments that have come in in chat uh, from Francis Alemiga says, thank you, Director, very, for your hard work. It has impacted a lot of people and youth, especially your model of farming and rabbits and poultry. Thank you so much for the unique approach. M. Mwasa said, amazing done work. Simon Katuma says, uh, they have good quality good quality drugs at uh, vet pharmacy in the container village and they're willing to partner with you. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is something that has come in from Monica Kavuma. Uh, my question is, how has the government supported your work given that you are engaging the youth? Are you leveraging PDM and how supportive are the banks? Maybe we can start with that question, then we shall go on to the next other questions that have come in. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. Government has supported us by making sure we have peace. That is something I can confirm, that we have peace, because we work day and night. We have not had challenges of peace. And uh, we have an MOU with, <laughs> with the Ministry of Agriculture, and this MOU helped us to get MOUs with the different districts. Okay. And uh, I think also the other important thing that government is doing implicitly is uh, giving us direction of what we should be doing because we are following the government programs. We are supplementing and complementing government programs because the work our youth are doing in the communities, they are doing extension service. What I didn't say is that for each of the parishes we operate in, our youth have a projector and tablet and they do training. Our youth earn from three economies. We say they earn from the knowledge economy. Whatever we have trained the youth, they go and train other youth at a fee. We charge between 1,000 and 2,000 per session at village level. So our youth are also realizing that I can be in agriculture, but my job is being an infopreneur in agriculture. So by government having a system of extension that does not reach everyone, it has helped us to take position in that space. Then the other thing that we are doing, when you look at the parish development model, when we started our PELA model in 2015, PELA is the Parish Entrepreneurship Learning Association. All our youth are in what we call PELAs, and this is a place where we implement what Mr. Wery called the Deca Hub. Every, all the youth that we train, once they go to a parish, they make sure they create an administrative structure in their parishes. So we are working alongside that administrative structure of government, parish level, 
uh, they have a structure where they have the advisory councils, they have now the parish investors. These are people that help us to run our business well. And among these people, we find that we have people like the leaders, they are part of what the youth are doing. So they do a lot of stewardship. Then the other question about PDM, I think PDM is well aligned to what we thought about in 2015 and our youth will definitely benefit and government will have good results where our youth are involved. Then when it comes to the banks, okay, we, we have had many banks coming to us to fund us here and there. We, of course, we are very sensitive to costs of money. We find the interest rates a little high for what we do because we have a lot of charity in whatever we do. So we have worked with the Microfinance Support Center. It was able to give us, we have done loans twice with the Microfinance Support Center and the rates were reasonable for us and we were able to pay at our own pace. That's the only institution that we have worked with. However, right now we have a partnership with the Equity Bank that is supporting our youth to be able to access loans without collateral which is a big support in terms of what we are doing. Although all our youth save money, we have parish savings and loan associations in all our parishes, we are saving money. And together we save in our Goody microfinance, we have about 900 million now that our youth can access at 1% per month. So every challenge we have in our business and in our ecosystem, we try to find a solution around it. So the youth are saving, we are borrowing the money at 1% and we are actually contemplating putting it at 0.5% because this is development money to help us be able to build our businesses. And yeah. then in terms of government, I think the other thing that we have seen with government, of course, we are, we believe we are one of the biggest taxpayers. We pay about 800 million yeah, which I think is nice. We feel nice that we are contributing to the growth of our business. And because of that, they are always keeping us on our toes. You receive emails from URA every day. It has actually become one of, we want to assign an officer for URA. You always have emails being reminded of things you have already done all the time. <laughs> so they yeah. remind us to be compliant. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. There's something you mentioned. Uh, government actually supports a lot of businesses indirectly, and uh, at least we are glad that you are benefiting from this. Um, there's a question from Simon Katuma. With increased feed prices, how do you manage to keep, how do you manage to keep floating? And similar to this question is uh, from Alex Omodo is, what cost pricing form are you using to manage the profitability using the youth value chain. So in terms of the prices of uh, especially grain increasing, it was a positive on our side. Remember, we have youth who are into feed production. So they, they are able to get a lot more money than they used to get. But at the same time, this has increased the cost of the final meat product that we are selling. So in our value chain, we have been able to calculate what is the margin of profit for each person alongside the value chain? Uh, maybe what I didn't say, which didn't come out clearly, we are trading internally. The one of feeds automatically sells to the one raising the animal. The one raising the animal automatically sells to the one roasting the animal. So we are aware of what is happening as a value chain. And I think this also helps us to be fair you don't want to say, I'm going to buy my chicken a kilo at 6,000 when you know that the cost benefit analysis of making a kilo of chicken is 8,000. So we, we believe that as the customer of the chicken gets used to the new price, it will be very good for our youth, especially who are in feeds. 
So in terms of managing profitability, we try to ensure that we are running a fair, fair. value chain because ah. everybody knows what everyone earns at their point. Yeah. Okay, that's actually a very interesting model. Um, basically, the ecosystem is supporting itself. And okay, that's very good. <laughs> interesting. Um, there's a question from uh, Robert Pisache. Uh, usually, it's difficult to know to stop a particular line of production that is not making money. In your case, you are still making money. There's always reason for not making money and hope that will come around. How do you know something will not work out? And then the question from uh, Henry, who's like, where is your project in Kamui located? They would like to extend to his sub-county Namuendwa. Nam okay, in, uh, in terms of stopping a line that is not producing. Now, because we are into the food business, in a way, people are always eating. And right now, because our main target is the middle class, the middle class will always eat. So it's not that the that particular line is not making money, it's that you think you can go for a bigger responsibility and leave the other people in your own ecosystem do that other side. First of all, when you look at the different levels of the value chain, now when you go to production in general, production requires a lot of time, requires a lot of space. So if you are a farm in Nigeria, 14 acres is very small, but imagine what if you had all these youth and each one of them has a particular space? So production by the masses gives you more volumes than producing massively. So it's, it's a strategic decision on our side. But again, how do I know that I should stop this particular line is no longer producing? We still have to go back to the same principles of business school that some of us definitely missed by not having gone there. But thank God people like Enterprise Uganda are helping us to learn these things. Cost benefit analysis is still a must for all of us. Being able to plot your sales. We have done a lot of record keeping where our youth have got to record how the animals are growing every week and what did they feed. Then they have to do an analysis. It's not just recording, but why do you think your animal has not reached the level that is expected? in this week. So still in our businesses, we also have to go back to that same thing. At times, we want to be recognized as business people when we are actually doing a hobby. You have the smallest business on earth. You are the one who has your 50 chicken and you are posing around, I'm a farmer. Yes, you are a farmer, but actually, are you making money or you are making that caretaker of the chicken just become rich and make you poor? And then you will complain that you didn't make money. So I think our biggest challenge is mathematics of business. And as a business owner, we cannot avoid it. Whether you hated mathematics or not, this time you need to be able to, to know that. No, let us know the break even point. Let us know what is the optimal we can do and how can we reduce cost? How can we reduce wastage? Being able to look at the revenue leakage is the job of the owner, the one who put in their money. Other people are assured of their salaries. They may not be bothered about the revenue leakage, but that is your job. Where is my money going? What is taking away my money? Then collaborating science and numbers. Because someone can tell you, you need all this amount of feeds, but you just know that these foods are going to be a waste because you know the conversion ratio of a bird, the conversion ratio of this particular pig I have and how much is requires of protein, of carbohydrate, that science, the owner must know whether they did what course. It doesn't matter. As long as you have decided to do agriculture, you have to learn it. All right. Ah, thank you very much. That's a lot uh, to take in, but it's very key as something that you present, you keep telling people, keep records, and not just of the finances, but also of the other things that are there. If you're saying you're buying feeds, but how is, who is what is the ratio of like, for example, saying conversion ratio, how much is this chicken supposed to take? What are the targets? It's also a lot of other information, not just the finances around it. Asaf was asking about uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week. Global Entrepreneurship Week starts from the 14th, from 14th to 20th of November. However, there are a number of events that are happening before. 
We're going to send out an email to everybody with some of the events that are happening, where you can actually go for a bit of um, networking and also see which one works for you. There is actually one that is planned for financial management, how to use finances to grow your businesses, how financial management is key to growing your business. You shall, it is part of the list you shall, you can always confirm and see which one you want to attend. Uh, there is uh, Maureen was asking, with such a huge loss, would agriculture insurance have helped? Is this in Uganda? Yes, we uh, have agriculture insurance. Oh, did it help when you had those losses? No. Okay. Uh, there's there a is question a, from... a lot to prove. <laughs> ah, it's a lot to prove, yes. <laughs> there's a lot to prove, then it becomes a full-time job proving. Proving, yes, that is true. Um, okay, maybe you shall get an insurance expert one day to come here and tell us about mm -hmm. how it works. Because people keep complaining about our ins insurance becomes an issue. There's a question by Robert Mande. Uh, please, you can unmute. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Naiga, for the good presentation. Uh, thank you, members, for taking time and uh, joining the platform uh, for learning. Uh, my name is Robert Mande, and uh, my question is, uh, entrepreneurship is, the truth is, Entrepreneurship is not for the faint hearted and uh, it comes with a lot of challenges, but uh, through failure is comes success. But according to your story, you became a farmer, you became an entrepreneur. Now, how did you manage to convince? Because uh, at, entrepreneur, uh, at entrepreneur stage, uh, especially on uh, idea, uh, many things are confused. You don't know where you're going, and even your members, they, they also don't know where you're, where you're taking them, but you have to convince them until things come clearly. So in those all confusion, uh, the downfall, the coming, coming back, how did you manage to convince your team that uh, they're on the right track? Because you changed a lot of stuff, which was automatically sending you to where you they are saying a uh, biocola they're not understanding them how did you manage to convince them losing all that money and where we did you uh where were you getting all the money to fund and the, how did you actually they are three in one how did you manage the family and you as a person uh, you and you as a person uh, plus the business thank you Okay, one thing is, uh, I think the, I don't know if it's an built character, is that um, I'm, I'm somebody who is determined, or I'm determined to do something. I become passionately involved with it, that it's difficult for me to get out of it. So even when we had all those challenges, my motivation stayed high. And I think that the youth and our staff in the ecosystem have learned me, have learned my character to the extent that they are adopting it, that we never get bogged down by challenges. Challenges cannot, will only come to people who are already doing something. You cannot have a challenge, you cannot have a loss when you had nothing to lose, you can't. But even in those losses, you still have something else that you have. So you cannot spend all the time mourning for the loss when you have something else that you can actually be nurturing. So what helped us in all those losses, they were not happening at the same time. There was always another enterprise that is running. So diversification in a way has, has a part to play in helping you to overcome some of this challenge. You have lost money in chicken, but your pigs are still running. As the pigs go, but you have already recovered from the poultry side. So you have other sources of income. The income will not be the same, but you still have sources of income. I think that is extremely very important. Then the team being able to learn who you are, <clears throat> what makes you happy, what does this and that. I think that's very important because when we lost our chicken, I am somebody who loves parties and, and I love happiness. I love being happy all the time. And it's one thing that we are nurturing in our network. Because we are living our life, our life is now. You cannot postpone happiness for the time you don't even know. 
So what my team did after the fire, they arranged the party. I went to the farm and I found a priest. I found they decorated the entire place and we decided to celebrate the things we had remained with. We had life, nobody had died. That farm at that point had over 500 people. Nobody died in the fire. That is something enough to celebrate. And after that celebrating, you start having posi a positive mind. And happiness is something very important in my experience. Happiness builds better ideas. Every time you surround yourself with sadness and happy people, you drain even the little good in yourself. So you, I think as entrepreneurs, we need to find that point that brings the best in us, regardless of the worst that we might be having in our lives. There is nobody who is 100% perfect, but celebrating your best takes you to the next level. True. Uh, this is very key, actually. Uh, your spirit around you uh, also goes into a spirit of the business. It mm. really helps a lot and also helps with uh, your employees and your partners. If you are always serious and worried, people will be like, ah, your energy is not that good. What are young people calling vibes these days? Mm -hmm. it is, yeah, so we have to, even in terms of uh, tough, uh, tough decisions, tough times, your spirit helps a lot. Uh, there's uh, a few more questions in, in chat. Um, okay, let me see. A comment from Dr. Abby, that one I'll, come, I'll merge it. Uh, Gab, Gerald says, thank you. Uh, and I'm, my number was your Onan, also says, thank you very much. And he loves your product. Uh, and he is one of your consumers. There's a looper from Noma Seeds. She says, thank you very much. I listened to you many times. And thank you for what you're doing for the youth and inspiring. With uh, this comment from Maureen Dahura, with all the great work you're doing, uh, shouldn't government be taxing? Government shouldn't be taxing you, but let you use the resources to reach more people. In essence, because you're doing something itself, should have initiated. But if I could just come in here, we have worked with something called social entrepreneurs, social ventures that are all over the country, and there are people who are stepping in in the gaps where they see government hasn't been done, hasn't done something. But instead of waiting for government to come and, and step in, they actually do something. So we have, we have found a lot of youth all over the country and a lot of adults all over the country that are in villages doing something small but something great. And this is something really good uh, that should be continued, not always wait for the government. Um, then Dr. Uh, Abe- There is also something which yes. maybe I didn't say. Yes. I can go on. Yes, please. we in the in the district where we are working and the different parishes, we have found Ugandans that are selfless. We call we hold meetings which are called sensitization meetings where we invite people in the districts where we operate. We have received over two thousand plus social investors, people who are willing to invest in the youth to be able to quicken their growth. These people have given land. Our youth had challenges of land. They have given land, please use my land. We even have people who have given over 10 acres to the youth to be able to implement. We have those who have given money, those who have given animals, some have given motorcycles. We have a large heart as Ugandans. Yeah. That is so true. this journey has so many other people that are supporting in different areas. And we actually want to document them because sometimes you, have, you are successful, but there are many people around you in the ecosystem that have enabled you to grow. For us, the people we call the pillar social investors have done a great job. Actually, that is very related to what you're saying about uh, documentation, documentation of what you have done. Uh, moves. This is a comment by Dr. Abe, uh, one of our partners at Moves. Says some at Moves they are looking for homegrown case studies to be written and published, and to be used in teaching and examining our students in strategic management. So he was asking, are you ready to partner with with them towards this? 
Definitely. I'm already a part of groups. Yeah. Yes, it's it's okay. it's nice. Okay. Who is your contact because point? There are many you? things which I've learned with time. Yeah. I'm saying there are many things which I have learned with time and how I wish I had learned them earlier. <laughs> so you if, them, if our story, right if time. our case can support people to learn earlier some of the things we have learned later, I think we shall make the world a better place. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing uh, Emmanuel Sanyo Safari has his hand up. Please unmute and go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Godula. This has been a very brilliant uh, presentation. Though my network uh, somehow failed me, I missed the part. Um, <clears throat> first of all, so sorry about uh, the fire that really got the, the farm last year, I think end of last year. It was really a, a, a big downside. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as an insurance practitioner, yes, you have mentioned briefly about insurance, but uh, going forward, as first of all, an elite person, you are aware about this, but how is are the pharma groups embracing uh, the idea of pulling some little funds for to, to safeguard their merchandise? And uh, on that note, I want to talk about just agriculture insurance that it has been taken up so fast uh, this year because of the government subsidy, such that by the end of June, it is usually done. So I would request that you can make plans to start on it by early next year so that you can also benefit from the government subsidy on uh, premiums. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Emmanuel actually did a talk on... Um, on insurance here. You can always look at uh, Enterprise Uganda page. You'll be able to review some of the things that he has done, what he talked about. Is it somebody, Monica says that your quote has impacted her production by the masses is better and producing massively. Uh, Alfred M says, thank you, doctor, for being articulated on this point, uh, program, keep it up. Ronald says, thank you for sharing, especially the flip side. A lot of success stories deliberately leave on Mr. Negative side. Yes, thank you very much, Doctor, for that. That is quite true. Um, we also have, we, Enterprise Uganda is continuing the business health check uh, where we provide diagnostics and support to businesses. We come to the business and tell you about, we do a diagnostic, review it, and we give you a report on the things that you're doing well, the things and, and the things that you could improve and give some recommendations. This is a complimentary to everybody who attends the recovery series. Uh, the link is going to be posted in chat uh, where you can be able to actually register for this. Uh, Rebecca says, thank you very much for our presentation. Key thing in business is not put all your savings there. If you have enough capital, put in some for that rainy day. There's something Dr. Goodler mentioned about diversifying your income, which is very good. Sometimes people are like, this is this other business line is bringing very little money. Still go for it because now that business line is bringing that little money that could help with those small expenses that are there every day. So diversify your income, but don't over diversify in that you collapse. Uh, Message from Isaac, thank you so much for IV for what you're doing for us youth and especially refugee youth. This seems to be a beneficiary. Uh, Dr. Naiga, could you please share your contact? Seems some people want to get in touch with you. This is Anne. Would this be okay? You can put it in chat. Chigwe uh, Godfrey uh, says, uh, thank you for your business and thank you for your journey and have been able to build resilience in your business. I think this has, just touched on this. Uh, okay. Uh, the link has been posted in chat. You can just click there to register. Uh, all right. So, Dr. Goodler, do you want to check that again or do you feel you covered it? How have you been able to build resilience in your business? I think I have covered it, but I think the most important thing is you, the person your character as a person and choosing. There is a, what I normally use for youth in my network, they know it. In life, there is always milk, but a fly can fall in the milk. 
it is up to you to throw the fly and drink your milk and proceed with your life, or it's up to you to keep crying about the fly and telling the whole world about the fly that has landed in the milk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is, that's a good one. Um, again, there's a comment from Rona, I'm one of the district agents for Ginger. Uh, I find Dr. Goodler so selfless, uh, so giving and teaching the youth, and you're so proud of having met her. Our lives are now being the same again because the transformation has big. She does Actually, there was good. somebody who had asked uh, where we are in Usoga. Yes. For Usoga region, we call it Eastern Central, and we mm -hmm. are in Ginger. We are not in Kamuli. We ever trained in Kamuli, people in Mbulamuti, what, but we are not. 100% in Kamuli. It takes, we need about $10,000 to be able to train one particular parish for it to run on its own. Okay. Um, mm, a brief question from somebody, some son, they've not named themselves. What can you do now with the insurance to be able to get your claim concerned you didn't get, get it before? Have you put in place things that will allow you to be able to claim insurance in future, learning from your past experience? Yes, we because every bad thing that happens to you is an eye opener, is a lesson. We have done different interventions. We have moved some of the enterprises, we have moved them from one place to another campus. We have put in place a lot of protection, especially for fire. We had constructed a lot with the wood for the work we had done at this campus in Nigeria. Because in Nigeria, the place we are in has a wetland part of it. And according to the agreement we have with NEMA, we couldn't construct with concrete. So it was purely wood. So whoever lit the fire, the fire went on so well. So we are decided not to construct there again. Instead, we are in at the green campus in Ruero, where we are able to construct with different materials. Okay, uh, thank you. Always learn from your mistakes. Always, always learn and implement. Um, Wilbur says he has learned so much about business. Thank you very much. Patrick is making a plea to anybody here. He made a total loss when he bought um, soya beans, seeds, and planted two acres which failed to germinate. So he says, if you're in a reliable supplier of seeds, please kindly get in touch with him. He has put his contract on chat. In, uh, Dr. Yashin says, Doctor, thank you very, very much. Extend to West Nile too. But I think you're in a row, isn't that? We are in West Nile yeah. already. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe you should be specific about which part of West Nile. We are in Arua. In Arua. Also, maybe, yeah, Yashin, maybe you can get in church in Arua and see how you can get there. Uh, Christina says, thank you very much. This has been a big lesson, especially in marketing. Uh, also, Ezra says, thank you for that. R Robert, I'm seeing your hand up. Is this from before? Uh, no, I wanted to, uh, to connect with uh, uh, Dr. Naiga. Uh, mm -hmm. As my mall, we have farm stands which are supporting uh, local organic farmers, organic, uh, to access profitable market, value-added market, stable local markets. So, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Naiga, we, if you have uh, produce, uh, we can buy them. You mm -hmm. can check on uh, our website the produce we are purchasing now. Uh, we just put farmstand.com, just remove R you will see the products we are focusing on. And then uh, if they're organic, we will have to come to the farms, we check and mm. test the products, then we take them on. Uh, farm stand, just remove R, you put farmstandy.com. Just remove okay, R, you see. Okay. okay. Okay, Robert, if you can just post that in chat, that would be very easy. Uh, also, Dr. Naiga, people have really requested for your contacts. I had put it there, but I can type it again. <clears throat> okay. But I don't pick calls. <laughs> ah, <laughs> you'd prefer email? I prefer messages, WhatsApp messages. Ah, okay. So maybe you can put uh, your WhatsApp number. 
Uh, what yes. is it? I can just type it out. 0701. Yes. Okay, I've typed it. 460865. 65. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, we have Global Entrepreneurship Week is a celebration of entrepreneurship. Maybe Dr. Naiga and anybody else here can join. In that week, you can just hold an event, either physically or virtually, that showcases what you're doing for entrepreneurs in the country, such that people who may want some of your services, who may want to learn from you, can find out. You can get in touch with Enterprise Uganda via email. I'm going to put there the email which you can use to reach us. Um, and you can actually read. Uh, Derek, maybe you can put there the, the form and the link to the form for GW and also the email that is required for GW. So Global Entrepreneurship Week, we shall talk about you. We shall send your event and talk about you to other partners who may be willing to find you and other entrepreneurs, well, countrywide. And also we shall put on the Global Entrepreneurship International website such that may be for international, you can find you if you carry out a Global Entrepreneurship event. Uh, this would be very good for us and to reach out. We also shall send out information with the events that are already there and you can get in touch. Uh, Dr. Naiga, yeah. okay, the, Derek has posted the Global Enterprise Partner Form, Partnership Form. You can link that to uh, talk about your business and see if you can get part of uh, GW. Uh, my takeaway from today, Dr. Naiga, is be your own auditor. This is actually very important for entrepreneurs. Know your business. Don't expect airport to know your business for you. Otherwise, you will have problems and challenges. Do not delegate certain things as a founder. First know them. First know them before you go and delegate them. Uh, then there is build an ecosystem around you. Have a support yeah, system. Partners. Partners. Uh, partners, competitors, all these people can become your support. Uh, there are weekly sessions that I personally attend for my business where I just talk around with other partners. And we also have weekly meetups. And Enterprise Uganda is trying to encourage these. You can host them and you let us know and we shall tell people about them so people can come. And you just build your own ecosystem around you. This has been very helpful for me and, and a number of other business, uh, business and entrepreneurs. Energize yourself. Do not get comfortable. Keep moving up. Always think about what is the next level. Uh, somebody had put their hand up. Maybe that can be our last question. Uh, Samsung, I think. Oh, that was a mistake. Uh, if there's no other question, uh, thank you, Dr. Goodler, very much. There's a comment from Rogers Manda. Thank you, Dr. Goodler. I'm impressed and will be in touch. Please note, Dr. Goodler does not take phone calls. Send a WhatsApp message or send an SMS. Unless you're one of our people, people, then you should take your phone call. Uh, I'm assuming. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's because I'm always in meetings. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, Dr. Goodler, any last words as we wind up today? Ah, okay. I think that is it for today. Thank you very much, everybody. We shall send you emails about Global Entrepreneurship Week, the business health check, in case you want to, in case you're interested to join. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Uh, see you next week. All right. Okay. See you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.
She was a little nigga, he'll jam on her. Spanish town, my bond, that's where I come from. From me looking at my face, you see a de la Vegan. Well,